This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. Today. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. Dalton may join us for this whole time. That's good. You have a live cat. I have the cat painting. Yeah. You know, we have to balance. Okay. Welcome to another episode of the Wedge Life Podcast. I'm joined by returning co host Peggy Sue Amihi. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me back after after Google Doc Gate. Yeah, you have come to this episode totally unprepared. Fortunately, I I did kind of prepare. You did a great job. Thank you. And uh, so after you were on episode two, right? And after that, I got a lot of compliments. Only they were all about you. Oh, really? But, you know, I thought it was all you. So. No. Well. We have survived your absence, but I was worried we wouldn't. It's like if Peggy Sue can't come back for every episode, how are we going to do this? I'm pretty sure this is using the wrong microphone. Oh, you think? Okay, it definitely can, is. It's using I the light. Stop it. Yeah, where were we? Uh, you were paying me compliments, and then I was on mute because I don't know how to use. Yeah, we these. had a little bit of lap, laptop mic at the beginning of the show, but that's fair. Should we play your theme song, or I guess we should, probably shouldn't burden Kate. Knuth with your theme song. Probably not. Right since it's not fair since she doesn't have a theme song. Right. There she is. Miss Northeast Minneapolis. <laughs> okay, we played your theme song. Thank you welcome, for that. Well, that, welcome that back makes to you the feel show. Like it. It makes me feel like a Disney princess. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try real hard to say Knuth because I want to say Knuth. Do you struggle with that? No, I don't actually. I'm very name sensitive though. I have a weird name. So um, except for Jacob French Fries, uh, who I intentionally refused to learn correctly. Um, I'm well, that, pretty. That is, that is the trick to saying his name correctly is the French fries. It sounds like Fry. A lot True. of people say Fray. A lot of people just don't speak his name. Are you a loyal listener? You said you weren't watching the show, but you're listening. I'm listening. I have, I think I'm getting close to up to date. It's so many. I'm excited. Like there's, I feel like you've gotten good, like feedback or good response. That's the word from candidates and stuff. So this is, it's been helpful too, because I feel like I'm the person that people ask, like, who are you voting for? Um, so I'm now like, well, if you have questions about who these people are, listen to these podcasts. Um, but now I guess maybe I should send them to Blaws, boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, fe- I'm feeling sensitive because... He copied you. I, uh, I think he made it, may have had his first, but... I was feeling guilty about forcing people to come on a podcast where a guy has a cat painting on the wall. Like it felt like an indignity for very accomplished people who are running for office. But then I found out there's another podcast called Beers with Blois, which I pronounce Blois. Blois. I I like he's French. Yeah, I do the French pronunciation. That's nice. That's nice. Now I don't feel guilty. You may have to tell listeners who Blois is and why we are making fun of him just a bit. He's a... He's like a PR guy who also is a talk radio host who also has a podcast. Basically, the thing Carol says I am, which is a well, he's a lobbyist, basically posing as a journalist. Yes, a hundred percent. So, and I'd say is conservative too aggressive of a labeling for him? I'd say he's pretty no. conservative. I mean, by Minneapolis standards, yeah. You may know him as the guy who put together a list of top 10 taco places and not a, not a single taco recommendation was. It was like, I don't know if it was a troll from him or what, but it was like all taco restaurants owned by white people. Mm. Like Taco John's was on the list. Like Taco John's was on the list? Was Taco yeah. Bell on the list? I don't 
remember honestly in one year out the other but and then I, mean, like, I have an i have an arby's photo up here on my wall so i can't i can't really make fun of blois <laughs> uh people dragged him and then it was great because like jason de russia came to his like defense which i'm like no one should defend this this man has not eaten a good taco ever in his life clearly i don't remember taco cake i can't believe you missed out on this all, all the, all the Twitter peeps were dragging him for like not coming within set ten miles of Lake Street with his recommendations. Yeah, he doesn't seem like somebody who lives in Minneapolis. I feel like if he lives in Minneapolis, he lives like in the Mill District in a condo. Right. Yeah. And like drives everywhere for an unknown reason, despite living walking distance. So to promote what's coming up after the Kate Knuth interview, we're going to be doing another chicken tweet. There are more chicken. There's another chicken tweet that Peggy Sue's going to narrate. Very excited about that. And then uh, I'm excited to just read this response that you got from your graphic. So I might I might read your graphic. To... Did I get a response? Yeah, from David Wheeler. Oh yeah, David David Wheeler. He was he was irritated at the uh, the Venn diagram of. Minneapolis endorsements, which placed him on the conservative side. Yeah. Well, some people have really interesting definitions of progressive. Actually, some people just have really white understandings of progressive. Yeah. For a long time, he didn't have any issues on his website. He was just kind of coasting on the fact that he was city council member in Duluth a while ago. And, uh, Got a few endorsements for BET when he was running unopposed. I told this story to Conrad yesterday on the special episode of the podcast, but sure, people who work with campaigns are calling uh, potential caucus goers and delegates. They can't find David Wheeler supporters, which made me happy. Well, I mean, to be fair, there's also so many supporters in that or so many people to support in that ward. Like, it'll be interesting post- DFL endorsement process to see who kind of sticks around. I still uh, don't know how to caucus. You, you registered, didn't you? I registered and then I re-registered. I was requested to be a city delegate and I said, you got it. Will do. Who requested it? Uh, uh, the Krista campaign. Our dear friend Pine. Well, you got such strong feelings about Mayor Fry. You weren't going to become a city delegate? No, I'm vibing. I like, I'm here to do what I committed to doing, which is being a ward delegate. But now that's all right. I have strong feelings, but I don't feel like I have to act on every strong feeling. People are going to judge you. It's lucky that I turn off comments on YouTube because people are going to judge you. <laughs> I mean, people can judge me. I Yeah, maybe this is like, I should be better. You've got a derogatory nickname for the mayor and you, you weren't going to become a delegate. It's like the definition of, you know, spending your time grinding that axe on Twitter. It's not like I wasn't showing up to the convention. I just, you know, I also have like maybe the opposite problem, which is that I have no strong feelings. No, you know, obviously I'm very excited to meet Kate Knuth, but um, I had not yet decided to have strong mayoral feelings other than hating Jacob. So we've got we've got a wide, <laughs> very high quality group of alternatives, I think. No, totally. And I think that's part of why I was like, oh, I don't feel like I'm like as informed as I could be yet. I mean, you, you, rank, you rank one, two, and you make sure Fry doesn't get the endorsement. That's what you can do. That's the strategy. Well, see, this I'm learning. Again, I still feel a little nervous that I'm not totally certain I know how it works. I mean, it's just another form. It's, yeah. There's nothing to figure out. I think just the amount of information makes me feel like it's going to be harder than it is. I think the sub caucusing of the caucus registration was confusing to people. Thank you. Yes. I, I felt very overwhelmed. I also was like not sure if I did it right. I just hoped for the best. Our guest has arrived. <gasps> Yay. Welcome. Okay, our guest is here. Kate Knuth is running for mayor of Minneapolis. Welcome to the Wedge Live podcast, Kate. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. 
And just to introduce you, Peggy Sue is here and she, I know you're a very co- accomplished person. You accomplished a lot at a young age. Peggy Sue is a former Miss Northeast Minneapolis. So I, I had heard yeah. that. That's very cool. I, um, <laughs> So I, the the folks in my town, some like to say that I grew up in suburban Northeast. So I, I grew up in New Brighton. Um, oh, nice. Okay. So yeah. yeah, we're we're fellow suburban Northeasters. I, I grew up in Columbia Heights. So I always say like it's Columbia Heights is less North than parts of South Minneapolis are South. So in like spacing wise, so I'm like, it's the same. Like New Brighton's, New Brighton's more suburban, but Columbia New Brighton is more suburban. I my claim to fame in New Brighton was that I was drum major of our marching band, and we had a very good marching band, the Marching Knights. So that was part of my early years. We also have a claim to fame that our council president and I went to the same high school. Oh, really? Yeah, Lisa Bender. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that Le- they would people would attack Lisa Bender for is that she wasn't from Minneapolis. She's from a far distant suburb. That's what they would say. That was the attack line on Facebook. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, I, the thing, one of the things that I think is great about Minneapolis is there are deep roots and there are always new folks coming and we want to make sure they're welcome. Yeah. So, Are you prepared for people to say things like that about you if you're elected mayor? <laughs> I am prepared for people to say all sorts of things about me. I'm sure they already have. Um, it is... Uh, you know, I'm not new to electoral politics. I ran um, in my mid 20s and served three terms in the legislature, and people said stuff about me then too. So it's unfortunately it's part of the job, and I, you know, I try to be very respectful of others in public life, and um, and also have a sense of humor about the whole thing because it's going to get meaner. I don't, I can't say I know what the state legislature is like, but it's going to get meaner. It, it, that you think this race is going to get meaner? Oh, not not the race, but if you win. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you think you were done with running for office when you left the legislature? I was. Um, I didn't know. I get. I'm not someone who had a whole plan of running for office and moving between offices. Mayor of Minneapolis wasn't necessarily on my radar, but I'm someone who is very committed to my community and very committed to serving in ways that I think are useful. Um, and I think a lot of politics can be timing. So I guess I had no idea if I would be done or not. Um, I was open to it, but I was also, there was many other things I was working on and doing as I was, uh, as I left the legislature. Yeah. And I, get the sense from reading stories about you getting into the race and your comments that you felt there was a sense of urgency about running for mayor right now. Like maybe it it didn't fit with your, where you are in your life, but you felt like you had to do it. Can you talk about why you felt that sense of urgency? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think we can all feel that Minneapolis is in a really historic moment potentially right now. I think it's really unsteady. There's a lot of conflict um, and yeah, it may, I, I have a young daughter. I have a business that I'd started about 18 months ago. That's been going really well, uh, climate strategy, policy and consulting. Um, so I wasn't necessarily looking to <laughs> upend my life about, to run for public office, but, um, you know, given where our city is and given the moment we're in, I think we are set up to make this not just a historic moment, but like a real turning point to a more just, a more resilient, a more sustainable future and a future when actually everyone in the city can actually be safe. Um, And I'm just not, I don't trust that the mayor um, has the ability and the trust of the community to help us navigate this moment in a way that will make it into a turning point. And so um, that's how I, that's why I really, felt the um felt the desire felt the need to 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 step up and run i'm a little nervous you know i feel that turning point feeling too and i'm i'm worried we could turn in a different direction you know a less progressive direction like the the possibilities are open for something better but it's also possible we kind of turn back the clock yeah i think that um 
I think that's a very real feeling. Um, so I study transformation. Like I wrote a PhD about how we drive deliberately drive transformational change towards sustainability. So I have spent quite a bit of time both like thinking about and writing about and grappling with um, how to um, how transformative change happens. And it's not something that any single person or group of people controls, but you can kind of try to steer it. Um, and I think that's the kind of moment we're in. The other thing that is, there's no, there are these moments where big change has the potential to happen. I think we're in one that systems are breaking down. We're not sure how, what the outcome is going to be. I think it's bigger than just Minneapolis, right? There's been a pandemic. There was the insurrection. There's all sorts of stuff. Um, there's this, the uh, racial injustice and policing. Um, but the thing is, it's not guaranteed to get better. And so I think that's really a part of what drives me too, is that I'm going to do everything I can to try to make it get better. Okay. Peggy Sue, do you have anything? Yeah, I guess I was just building off of that. I'm wondering what, what a success look like then for you if things don't get better, right? Like I, I feel like there's this desire with our elected officials that they come in, especially in major cities like ours and they like, you know, they make it a million times better. They right all the wrongs, right? They, you know, make everyone happy. So yeah. what does success look like for you? Yeah. You know, if you do win, how do you, how do you have wins even amongst maybe kind of losing overall? <laughs> you know, to me, the most basic fundamental win would be that every person in the city feels like more invested in the project of making Minneapolis a place that um, works for all of us and that their government is a partner and a tool for doing that. Um, so there's like specific policies underneath that, like obviously investing in um, making our city more climate resilient, making our like wholly embracing the need for significant change in public safety um, but I'm really nervous about the basic of basic like foundation of democracy. And so to me, you don't not, not everyone ever is going to agree in a democracy. Um, and we're, but I think there's still trust that that the system is worth investing in and it's an essential partner for us to create our common life together. So I think there's, um, there's lack of trust and there's uncertainty about that from, from many folks in our community for all sorts of good reasons. Um, and I'm not willing to give up on that quite yet. In fact, my answer is to lean in even more and run for office. Um, so that, if that, if I, it, that, that would be it, you know, people see our city government as a, as a partner and an entity for us to create a common good, a better life for our city together. Okay, let's move to public safety. Mayor Fry has characterized the mayor's race this year as a choice between you know, eliminating police entirely, as he suggests his opponents want to do, or keeping and reforming them. And he calls himself, you know, the both and kind yeah. of mayor. Do you share his assessment of the choice this year? No. Um, I think the people of Minneapolis are smarter than having the, the stark choice of this election and there's no police tomorrow. And I think people are also smart enough and been through enough to know that we can't keep doing the same thing in policing. And without the charter change, we're required to have, uh, and, and this is a public safety charter change, which I support and the mayor doesn't. Um, without that change, we still have to have a minimum number of police. We still have a police chief reporting directly to the mayor. Like the foundational structure of it is still there and it doesn't open up the possibility of really investing in public safety as like a whole system thing. That's not only police. Um, do I imagine police being gone in a year or two, five, maybe even 10? I'm not convinced of that. I think if we build a system and we trust it enough, and we see that this public safety system can keep us safe without police, maybe then. Um, but I don't think we're quite to that point as a community. I think there, um, but I do think we're to the point of 
trying something pretty significantly different because the system we have right now is just, it's not working for a whole bunch of reasons. So broadly speaking, what would the Minneap- the hypothetical Minneapolis Department of Public Safety, if the charter public safety charter amendment passed, what would that look like at the end of your first term in 2025? Uh, well, I would love for it to have, I, w- I, I'm, I may start with the commissioner or the head of the department. Uh, I think that person needs to have a real strong um, public administration social work, public health background. I'm not totally exact, you know, I don't (laughs) don't have a single person in mind yet, but in someone then who understands policing, but is probably not out of a policing background. Um, And then I can imagine multiple entities underneath that, uh, like the Vision Zero work with traffic safety, the mental health response, um, the 911 response, uh, the Office of Violence Prevention, the Youth Violence Prevention that's been in public health. And, and so the, the whole like cr- prevention and intervention part of public safety that's sort of in policing, but in a bunch of other different departments too, I think would make sense to bring that together and then be in relationship with policing, which I would hope would shift the culture of what we understand policing is and shrink what we actually need like armed law enforcement for, because I think we don't, I mean, the fewer situations we have that can be escalated, you know, to obviously killing is the worst, but like bad interactions with community members and police that just make people not trust government, make people not trust neighbors. Like that's a problem as well for like the foundation of our safety and democracy. And so I think that's an important piece of the shift is as well as that day-to-day relationship with um, public safety officials and, you know, the subset of them being police will be an important part of, um, of this year of work. And I also think, you know, I can describe what it looks structurally, um, but the success, the success will really be like, have people felt heard and bought in? Do they understand the decisions being made? Do they feel reflected in the decisions being made? Like that process matters. And I know you, you'll pay attention to government process and community engagement. And, and I think that's super important for um, transforming our public safety system. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm hopeful as we come out of the pandemic and as we get new um, city leadership, you know, not all of it new, but some that, that work of really engaging with our um, full community and really listening about who who it's not working for and who's been harmed and trying to reflect the that in the in the system we come up with, I think is super important. I can nerd out on government process, and I actually think that's a good thing here. Not so you don't make decisions, but like people need to trust it. Like people need it's yeah. so visceral. It's our safety. It's how we feel in our neighborhoods. Um, so of course people need to trust it. I have a, a question, just kind of like the first comparison is like to to Jacob French Fries, who like really wants, you know, keep the police. We think everything's going really well. On the opposite end of the spectrum is people who say reform is not enough and mm-hmm. are asking for abolition. Mm-hmm. And I think we're seeing that really big swing between people. Um especially after like the second round of what we've had, you know, with Operation Safety Now Mm -hmm. and the the murder of Dante Wright. So I'm wondering how do you feel like that fits in? Like your stance feels almost like is maybe not going to feel like enough to people. So what, you know, what do you do about that? Um. I, it probably won't feel like enough for people, some people, and it'll probably feel like too much for others. <laughs> like that's, um, and that's really like, I come from like a governing and a public sector government background. And often there's a fair amount of dissatisfaction. And, and there's also like, we got to make this work. Like we have to, we have to figure out our path together. And, um, I think part of my job in the mayor's office would be, I'd, I, I need to figure out a better phrase than this, but I think about like aggressively communicate, not like in your face, but just be very 
intentional and very present and very um, uh, empathetic to people's concerns. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how else we do it except to be like very out may, intentional communication. Maybe you can think of a better word than like aggressive isn't right the word, but it's like, you need to just do it again. Like people need to trust that we are making significant change and people need to trust who are scared of the change that we are thinking and working very hard to build up public safety. Um, like it comes from both, both ends. And, you know, the, I think that's a, that's both the communication. And I also think there are things we can do pretty quickly to, to see real progress. Like the pretext stops is a really clear first example. Like why can't we just have fewer pretext stops allowed in our police policy? Um, that's actually something like the mayor has power over right now. And I think it's something that erodes trust and makes people unsafe and doesn't get a real public safety benefit. Um, and that's the kind of progress where people will be brought in to like trust that we'll be continuing to do more. So, so MPD's killing of George Floyd, Brooklyn Center PD killing Dante, right? You know, police killing of black men happens with regularity, predictability. We know it's only a matter of time before it happens again. If you're elected mayor, why would your administration be successful in preventing these killings where, you know, basically all previous chiefs and mayors haven't been successful? The goal is success. And um, I am also clear that every single mayor has tried to do this. Um, police killing people is deeply personal for me. I have experienced that, unfortunately, in my own family. Um, and I also get that my family's white. And um, so we experience like day to day um, interactions with police in a different way. And I'm like, as it's so bad that I, when I thought about running for mayor, I gave myself two days to just sit with the like, what would it, what's the feeling if police kill someone when I was mayor? Would I be capable emotionally of showing up with my community? for my community in a way that helps us navigate that. Um, I hope that never happens, but I would feel like given what has happened, that it would be irresponsible to even think about running for this office without having really wrestled with that. And um, what I came to is that I think this campaign would get me ready. <laughs> um, and this isn't exactly the question you asked. You asked about like preventing, which is, is what, what we are going for. And I think um, creating the policies and the approach to public safety to reduce the number of potential interactions that can lead to police hurting people and ultimately the worst killing people is, is where we need to go. Like that's why I focus on pretext stops. That's one of the things I've talked about is um, not bringing law enforcement in a way that would create confrontation at encampments. Like we saw in near North a couple of months ago. Um, when, if they're, you know, like the call for George Floyd, did that require an armed law enforcement or could there have been more of like a, a regulatory services kind of person who would show up and deal with a potentially, um, uh, why can't I think of the word? <laughs> counterfeit. Thank you. Thank you. My brain was not working on the counterfeit. Um, did that need an armed law enforcement person? I and and should we be having someone who's had fifteen plus, um, prob you know problematic incidents in terms of how they've treated people in Minneapolis with Derek Chauvin as a training officer? Like there's there's multiple things about this that you could change to reduce and with the goal of eliminating police killing people in our city. So this might have a short answer. Do you support prohibiting the use of less lethal crowd control weapons like gas and rubber bullets? Yes. Okay. So related to that, um, you know, looking back at Operation Safety now, a lot of residents, business owners, the mayor. Is the it, are you talking about Operation Safety Net or Safety Now? Oh, that's, this is a common, commonly confused. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> the one that was like the National Guard or the one that's yeah, like the, endorsing candidates, but it's unclear the, whether they're... The multi-jurisdictional okay. law enforcement and military... Okay, that's Operation Safety Net. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, we hate I them should, both. I shouldn't have made that clear. mistake. I, well, this is the problem. The fact that you even could make the mistake, I think, is a problem yeah. for like people in the city being able to make sense of what's happening. Huh. I thought you were talking about Operation Safety Net, but you were saying Operation Safety Now. That's why I asked. Yeah, you're right, because that's how I had it written in my notes. But I meant the multi-jurisdictional okay. task force. Thank you. So so a lot of residents, business owners, the mayor, the governor, didn't want a repeat of you know the destruction that happened in 2020 in the wake of police killing George Floyd. But you know, I think we agree you don't want to gas and shoot protesters, yeah. you know, with rubber bullets. So what is the right approach and balance for a mayor to take yeah. to stop, to stop the destruction? Is it stationing soldiers on street corners? Um, so I think there is a few things here that are really important to pull out. Um, one is we had 10 months to learn <laughs> between when George Floyd was murdered and when the trial happened and I have looked for um, like after action report, le- lessons, how can we do this better? Um, and I know what I have been able to find is in July, uh, the head of emergency management for the city uh, went to the council and said that we're going to do this after action report. And now to me, a mayor would be like, we need that. We know a trial is coming. We know there could be issues. Like We need that and we need to be transparent about it and we need to be clear how to make it better. Um, and we need to use those lessons. Now, I have not been able to find that report anywhere. I'm, from what I understand, it doesn't exist. Um, the only like after action report that I have been able to find is from the GOP Senate at the state level, which I just don't really trust. <laughs> so yeah. um, it's not like a, a ba- it feels just like political attacks in a lot of ways. So I didn't find it particularly useful. Um, but that kind of commitment, like this is this is about as serious as it gets. Like we need to learn from what happened and make sure we're holding the value of, I mean, the the values that were talked about are keeping people safe and protecting first amendment rights. To me, there's even something a little deeper, which, you know, Saturday morning, the, before the, the conviction happened, I, I drove through downtown. I go grocery shopping downtown on Saturday mornings and it was nine o'clock on a Saturday and there's like people in military uniforms with big guns in downtown. And I was like, wh- how is this helping us? It just makes me feel unsettled at best and freaked out about like our democracy at worst. Um, and I didn't know why these decisions were made as a resident. And so that that's what I mean about like this like major communication um, is super important. And the real presence of leaders, public leaders and leadership during these times is super important. I, when I started calling people about, should I run or should I not? And multiple people tell me the only thing that made me feel better after George Floyd was murdered was when Melvin Carter got on and started talking. Um, He was the one who could calm me down. And like, there was just a sense about how he was communicating and who he, his grasp of what was happening. Um, So these aren't like specific answers. I'm not going to, pretend like I'm an emergency operations planning expert. Um, And I know that we should have had better information and it should have been better communicated. And if there's going to be something as huge of a deal, putting a few thousand National Guard troops into our city, I need to know why that choice is made and what outcome we expect from it. And I feel like none of that was made clear for the people of Minneapolis. Yeah, I mean, I can re- I can remember when it was taboo, the idea of putting soldiers, you know, as police on American streets. I, I think it, it still should be taboo. And if it's not, we need to know why, because it's a really big deal. It's a really big deal for the basic like foundation of our democracy. It, we're um, normalizing it as a response to police yeah. killings instead of addressing the problem of police yeah. killing people. Peggy I want to. I want to dig at that a little bit more, though, because I feel maybe not satisfied <laughs> with yeah. this kind of response, um, which is not to not to berate you with this, but yeah. I think saying, oh, well, if it's going to happen, we just need to know why 
isn't the best stance, right? Because that just means yeah. like, oh, it's gonna, it could still happen. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious, like, you know, you said the mayor had 10 months to think about it. You have had the same amount of time. So, mm-hmm. you know, what does that look like to you? Like, what are the alternate responses? Because I live in North and it is deeply troubling. Like I get like choked up thinking about like how scary as a person of color that was to drive to the grocery store because I had the same response on a Saturday going to Hy-Vee in Robbinsdale, getting to Robbinsdale, seeing no, you know, no militarization there at a grocery store, but the whole way through North is covered in, in soldiers. And that's really scary. Um, And I can't imagine for people like I'm real light looking, like it was probably not, it's about as scary for me as you, but for those in our community who that's even more terrifying saying like, oh, we just need to know, we need to actively communicate why, like we all know why they were there. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, I get the, the actively communicating why is something I was looking for. Like, okay, if you've made this choice, I need to, like, I didn't feel like I understood why, because to me, it's such a significant choice to have, um, national guard on duty like not in a protect you know not vaccinating not helping us with a flood like not help it but like with potential civil unrest or violence in the city or i you know i'm not sure exactly what um like that that was problematic to me but do we do we need the presence as visible like that's that i don't i don't think we need the presence as visible all that, like, that was very, I I would not see that as a good response moving forward. Like, we're, do we need some people ready to go? Do, did I feel like, did the city, after the third precinct burn, after um, multiple nights of unrest, I think there were people who were looking for calm, Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, the response to the, to the trial, um, just the, like, it felt like intimidation. And I don't think that that, um, we can't build the walls out of this, like build wall. I, I that it feels like continual wall building. And, um, so I study s- systems and system change a lot. And part of it is you can keep ramp, like one of the problems systems get in and they keep ramping up and the fighting keep happening, the conflict. And, to stop that, you need to do something fundamentally different. And to me, having armed military people like just hanging out in the city for days didn't feel fundamentally different. And so my priority would be to find a way to do it without <laughs> doing that. I mean, priority one, don't have police kill people because that's just wrong. Priority two, if that happens, and there is unrest, like better proactive across jurisdictional issues, not using military grade weapons against people in our city. And then three, if we're planning like something like the trial beforehand, like just having the presence in a way that I think raises the, um, the anxiousness, the anxiety of everybody in the city, I don't think is useful. Um, and so my you don't have theory, to have an answer too. So you, you what? You don't have to. Ha- you don't have to have a solution. I don't. Right? I mean, I, I will say, like, I I've been running for a few months. I have, you know, I have some basic sets of principles and values. I've been watching. I'm a resident who's been very frustrated, obviously, for the last few years. Um, and you know, I also don't have the tools of someone governing, so I I don't get to pick up the co- the phone and like call the governor or call the head of the national guard and be like, what are the options? But I'm trying to like outline how I would think about the challenge a little bit for you, because um, one of the things I don't like to do as a politician is like make huge promises and then like not have them jive with reality of governing. What I do want to be clear is that I have like my, the set of values I hold And one of them is like digging in to try to really make these changes and like really digging in through the work and the process of governing. Um, That is one of my like significant 
values alongside of the policies and the changes we need to make. Yeah, I just more wanted to kind of like push on that. So I wasn't asking for a 100% solution. <laughs> so I wanted to, like, I want to answer things, but I'm also like, I can't promise stuff because I'm not like, I don't have all the tools to know all of the like, I didn't have people ask, what would you have done after George Floyd was murdered? I was like, I didn't have the intelligence. I didn't have the like, information from multiple different places coming in. So I don't like, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking is really not something I feel comfortable with. Um, but there's, yeah. So, but there's also like building the relationships beforehand and really leaning in and being present as crisis is unfolding. Those are two things that I can like promise that I would really do as mayor. Peggy Sue, if you keep asking the tough questions, we're going to promote you to uh, host in chief. <laughs> oh, I mean. <laughs> But I just, I'm going to push. I was, I was easy on Elliot because we love him, but I think. Are you not saying that we you don't, don't love Kate? You. Oh, and I'm saying. I mean, that I, I love Elliot him. too. Let's yeah. <laughs> it was like more of fluff, like Elliot over everyone any day. Right. But this is a little bit, you know, it's higher stakes. Right. So I'm going to push when I feel like it's not necessarily like. I, I've, I feel I've like I can before. handle pushing. That's, yeah. if I can't handle pushing on like live then I probably can't handle being there. From me a resident with my like cat in the background. Yeah, I think you're all right. We're not we're not ending any careers today. No. I promise. Except for maybe my hosting career. So let's talk about climate change. I'm a little excited at the prospect of having a climate change mayor as somebody who cares about, you know, street design, transportation, mm-hmm. housing. You've spent your career working on climate change. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you'd call yourself a climate mayor, but I'll call you a climate mayor. What does it mean to be a climate mayor? I think it means be like, I will be an unabashed climate champion. Like it, I think this moment is, it just calls for it. And I think people in this city are ready for it. The science is clear. The politics have shifted. Like the way the politics have shifted in the last even five years, even three years is something I could not have even fully imagined. Even as someone who like literally has studied 350 in the climate movement for the last five or six years, um, it's been pretty mind blowing to see the sea change. And in some ways it feels both like our, our city government and even more our state government is like running to catch up with that. Now, I, w- I don't want to say everyone in city government, but it, it does feel like at least the way we talk about it um, is, is not up to like, I think what the science requires or what people are ready for. Um, and so to me, climate, it's like racial justice too. It needs to be part of every decision and policy. And um, we need someone who's able to like back up the, when they're hearing a staff person or a fellow elected talk about an issue or a proposal, be like, okay, well, how does this affect the way like how can we get more emissions reductions or how does this affect the resilience or the way we're dealing with stormwater in this neighborhood? Um, and like, I have that, it's just like a muscle <laughs> in terms of how I think about uh, the questions I ask and how I understand the different intersecting parts of what makes our city. Um, and so, you know, I've thought about what do we need to do even more? Like I actually think the 2040 plan is really strong Um, I think the transportation action plan is pretty strong. Um, I think we need a mayor who's going to focus a lot on implementation and getting the leadership in to make sure we deliver on the promise of those plans. Um, I I think we need a mayor who is willing to use the bully pulpit of the office when the decision, like a lot of these decisions are made at smaller level, like you're engaging with the neighborhood and the people around the street, like but it's part of this overall bigger vision. And the mayor's job, I think, is to make those connections about why are we, why we want to make certain choices and how it fits in with the bigger direction that we're going. Um, And I also think we just need to take on natural gas in the city. (laughs) um, And we don't have, we haven't had an updated climate action plan since 2013. Um, And well, so there's, there's a couple pieces in that plan. I think that need to change. One is, 40% of the city's emissions are natural gas. Like we need to take, we just need to like understand that, get what it means and like really start moving on it. And then um, 
we need to bring like climate resilience, but that's like this wonky word. What that really means to me is like focusing in on the neighborhoods that are more vulnerable because of heat or because of overburdens of pollution and traffic. And so like bringing that like really strong environmental justice work into the, which has been the, it's in there because sorry, I'm totally nerding out of this, but you're wedge life. This no, is kind no, of what you do. We have, we have an hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, like there's really amazing work by advocates to bring environmental justice into our climate action plan. Um, but I think it needs to be even more at the center um, if and when we update that plan. What do you think? So, uh, go ahead. What do you, what do you think we do about the roof depot site? <sighs> I, um, and that was not a reflection of your question. It's a frustration of how it got to the point that it's at. So I have met with multiple of the community leaders um, and I went on a tour a couple weeks ago, month, maybe it's been a month at this point. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating, I think, um, to have this community that's like been asked to bear the brunt of a ton of development, like arsenic in the soil because of the pesticide factory that was there, the foundry that's currently there, the traffic going through. And so like East Phillips is just burdened by tons of historic pollution, the intersection of like racism and classism, like hitting this community. And they have come together with this vision and come to like heads with the city. And I get the city has spent like $10 million on um, this project. And I get that the city needs to, um, have its water yard employees have a better, like I, like I get the public works part of it, but I really struggle with asking a community that we have, that has been burdened with so much to like do that again. And so to me, I, I, I think we need to really dig in on finding a better solution. If we are truly committed to racial justice and environmental justice in this city, like we have to make different decisions sometimes, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. And I think this is a this is like a clear example of that kind of need. So earlier, you, you, oh, go ahead. Sorry, would you agree? I've extensively bullied Jacob on this on Instagram, <laughs> um, and he purported that uh, it would be um, a zero impact. There would have no. Uh, it would be a, a net neutral facility would you agree with that as someone who's a climate expert and like the roof depot site would be net zero yeah 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 that it would have been i mean the concerns that i heard when talking with residents were a lot around traffic and a lot around um heating up uh asphalt basically um and it's already a community that's really impacted by traffic pollution and like the the concern about like heating up asphalt when there's already like a pollution burden, like there is, it's just in with so many people, like it, that's super problematic. Um, so I, I trust that the community, the community clearly doesn't trust that assessment and we need to take that really seriously. Um, I will admit, I have not read the environmental assessment worksheet. Um, and I've talked with multiple of the community members. I've talked with lawyers involved in the, uh, in the process. I've talked with multiple city staff. Um, but, I I think it would have an impact in terms of pollution, but I I need to if I was going to like give you a really great answer on that, I'd have to go read the EAW. Um, and maybe as important is the community doesn't believe that, and and so this the, the city government hasn't pursued this process in a way that builds trust with a community that has been asked to deal with too much of the crap for too long. Like that's not okay anymore. Um, we need to take that really seriously. So earlier you anticipated one of my questions by saying, you know, the transportation action plan is great. The key is implementation. So yeah. I just wanted to compliment you on that. Checking off a question off my list. Sweet. <laughs> so you've said you support rent stabilization. The mayor is kind of against it, but also kind of saying he doesn't know what the policy is and he can't take a position. Yeah. So if you support it, can you explain what you think a rent stabilization policy accomplishes? Yeah. So 
I mean, as far as I understand, like the state of play in terms of the policy is that we need to just, we need to pass a charter amendment change, like a charter change in order to be able to like even have a rent stabilization policy. Um, So I support, like, of course we need to open up that conversation. We are dealing with rent increases that are making it untenable for way too many people in our city to be able to live here. And, you know, we have basic, like my gut instinct, you know, the values part I talked about, like we have a lot of wealth accumulation in our country, like a lot of capital accumulation. And we have a lot of folks who are not able to like make the basic economic security of life work. And is rent stabilization alone going to fix that? No. Is it a tool that we as a city should use to help folks who are struggling with basic economic security? Yes, absolutely. Do we need to get that policy right so it doesn't achieve the kind of outcomes that I think all of us would agree are not great for our city, which to me is is like basically flight of small landlords who are like trying to like build an investment and bring and build a community. Um, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to have just like big national giant companies owning a lot of the rental or almost all the rental properties in the city. Um, So I do think it's a policy we need to do and we need to make sure we're designing it in a way that truly achieves the kind of rent stabilization we've talked about and um, doesn't have bad outcomes, um, unintended outcomes that we don't want. I, you know, I've dug in a little bit on some of the studies that the council has asked for and worked with. I have, I'm not like a rent stabilization expert at this point. Um, but you could probably tell, I do like to dig in on details and this is one of the things we have to get right, but I am totally convinced that we, need to pass the charter change so we can actually dig in on the policy and get it right. It's like, it's not the only housing solution, but it is a piece of the, a piece yeah. of the pie, the piece of the whole. So in 2017, talking about big promises that go yeah. wrong in 2017, Mayor Fry pledged to end homelessness in five years. Do you think he set a goal that was too ambitious or did he, did he fail somewhere along the way? I mean, that would be awesome if he had accomplished that. That would be awesome. I would have loved to have, I think everyone in the city would have loved to have that happen. And I don't know, even if we hadn't had the pandemic, if it would have happened. Um, And, you know, this is one of the things that I'm going to be straight with. Like, I'm not, I want to be very clear about my values, very clear about where we're going, very ambitious with each other about what we're trying to accomplish. And not creating cynicism by making a big promise that I don't have a plan or even a, a, like a way to achieve that requires multiple other jurisdictions of government that requires significant kinds of investment that requires, you know, mental health and substance use services that we need to get like in place. And, And granted, like this probably wouldn't have been the pandemic. Yeah. The pandemic changes change things a lot. The civil unrest, which I think was connected to both the police violence and the pandemic changes things. Um, but I, I didn't know what the plan was to end homelessness in five years. And, you know, I've been struggling, like, I I guess I'd have, I I've like thought about what, what, when would I say we need to be fossil free in the city or how fast could we do that? And like, I have, a sense of what I'd like to say, but I haven't yet dug in quite enough to be, and I, to be able to like say that and say, this is how I imagine we'd get there. Um, so I don't, I didn't trust that he had that backed up in 2017 and I clearly don't trust it now. Um, cause we're not anywhere close to that. Um, not quite four years later. Becky Sue, do you have like a housing or transportation question? Yeah, I mean, I think I just love to know kind of your thoughts around, you know, housing development, right? Like, what are your, you, you live in a lovely part of (laughs) Minneapolis with not that many multifamily units. I think we're in a place where a lot more multifamily needs to get built everywhere. I Uh, agree. I I agree. (laughs) I have a a really lovely triplex a few doors down. I would actually would not, if they were going to, 
if people are going to tear down bungalows in my neighborhood, I would be more comfortable with a few of those rather than like a giant, a bigger single family home um, on the same lot. Uh, and I did previously live in Seward. So I have, I have, uh, I lived, I actually lived on Milwaukee Avenue in Seward. That was the first place I lived in the city. Um, so obviously a different, uh, a different neighborhood, a different feel, more, much more multifamily housing. And it's kind of a fun fact. My dad actually lived in Cedars 94 and helped rent them like right when it was built. And it was one of his jobs, like post-grad school was taking care of some of the Cedars 94. He didn't have a lot of money. So it was one of the ways he made his rent cheaper was to like do some caretaking of the Cedars 94 apartments, which I thought was kind of a fun connection because I ended up living very close by there. Um, So now I don't remember the question. I'm sorry. I was starting to, Uh, you know, yeah, no, it's okay. I'm just wondering, you know, like what, you know, how, what type of, you know, ways do you plan to influence the development of more multifamily in all neighborhoods? I think we're starting to see, we see it really concentrated. And then when it pops up in wards that don't like it, there's so much nimbyism. So how do you, I think we're at a space where we can't, there's, there has to be way more development. I think you, yeah. especially with climate change, you're aware of, yeah. you know, yeah. people are going to come here. So. Yeah. yeah. They, that's, <laughs> you're one of the few people who is like this, we're going to have a bit, ba- we're, we're a great place to come in the face of climate change. And I like totally think about that. We need to be a city that is good at welcoming people and is good at, um, and part of welcoming people is making sure there's enough places for people to live and that they can afford to live here. And you're not either crowding people out or like people who happen to live here in the early 2010s are like, okay, but everyone, no one else can make it work uh, or people who bought at that time. And so I, I do think the implementation of the 2040 plan is definitely something that we need to focus on in terms of like the barriers to accessory dwelling units, the barriers to triplexes, the barriers to um, getting more density within like the single family home neighborhoods. I also support um, investing more in public housing, which is, you know, a subset of it. I would support a public housing levy. Um, and I, uh, I I like to I'd be curious if he, I will admit I am not a huge podcast I shouldn't admit this on a podcast um but like do you think it's moving fast enough with the promise of density in the 2040 plan and if not what are some of the barriers that you think and that you would love to see a mayor or a council pushing on I'm sorry maybe this isn't fair I'm turning the question around but you guys are experts too so I want to know I, I pretend to be an expert on Twitter. Peggy Sue, you're an expert. <laughs> well, you know what? I think uh, as a planner, yeah. I think a lot about, I, I have a lot of climate change related anxiety, um, but also just in terms of like the Venn diagram of like climate change, rent stabilization and gentrification, like all those things like co-breeding into each other in this place where like, they, they all affect each other. Like if we don't build enough housing, rent prices are going to skyrocket. And if we stabilize rents, how, what's the effect on that on development? And at the same time, we have to start to have some policies in play to ensure that people aren't getting displaced. And so all of those things really have to coexist. And in my brain, the only way that I can think to like fix that is to build more, right? Yeah. Like I think we're starting to see rents level out partially due to the fact that we're building more housing than we Mm -hmm. have ever before. And vacancy rates are like starting to approach, not anywhere near where they need to be, but starting to approach a healthier vacancy for a city. And so as we continue to see, and I've talked to people who have been like, oh yeah, we moved to this place. We moved from here because of climate change. Like that's existing already today in 2020. Yeah, I I have talked to multiple of these people in the city already. (laughs) Yeah. And so as that continues to happen, as, you know, our neighborhoods, especially people who do want to have the single family home experience and purchasing single family family homes, displacing residents out of out of even places like Phillips or North mm-hmm. or wherever. I just think all those things have to play. And the only way that I can think to solve them is to like build more housing. 
um, because I think it, it attacks all of those things. And so in my, that's kind of my, my question is, is like, how do you plan to approach that? How do you plan to combat even in places that dense housing makes sense? Dense housing in Marcy Homes makes so much sense. And people in Marcy Homes are like notoriously some of the worst you know, NIMBYs that our community faces. So like, how do you start to build consensus and coach people through that, especially as a, as a climate policy expert that we have to build more housing we Mm -hmm. have to build it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I mean, you just articulated it very well. Um, And I think part of the mayor's job, I mean, we talk about the weak mayor we have, but strong mayor in terms of policing and, but part of what the mayor gets to do is change what we think is possible or what we th- like the, the, the narrative power of the mayor's office, the bully pulpit, however you want to think about it. And um, I would be excited to be a mayor to help us through these kinds of conversations and changes um, and there's going to be, con- there already is conflict. There was conflict as 2040 was passing, like through that whole process. Um, and I, you know, I get into Minneapolis politics, of course, like it's, there's conflict as we're figuring out who and how we're going to develop as a city. Um, but I'm committed to us being a city where not just rich people can live. And that is helping us take on, um, that is a solution to, climate crisis that um, is a that helps people see and feel like what it is to live in in a city where community is more fully knitted together like literally into the physical geography of the city and I think denser housing is part of that I mean that's when people are like the 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 hopeful about climate change I don't like that question very much but I think the thing that gets me excited about is if we get it right, like in the ways you're talking about, um, it actually like just makes lives that people thrive in more. Like it means we're more connected. It means we spend less time in our cars commuting, which like clearly shows makes people unhappier. It means that um, our kids can like go play more easily in the neighborhood. It means that we can get healthy food without having to, make it into a huge errand and you can just walk down the street, you know, like the thing is like a climate friendly life is once you get there and you get over the like fear of it being different. And I, you know, people, people like don't like different necessarily, but it's like, once you're there, it's actually pretty great. Um, and people like to live in these kinds of cities. And so I think, and we're in that messy change transition part, but I'm I'm pretty convinced that people will like it. Um, like it'll feel good, it'll feel healthy, it'll feel connected. Um, and I, the best way I can find, I have found to deal with my climate anxiety is to like really lean in to working with others to like figure out our path forward. So maybe you know, running for mayor is one of my productive responses to being freaked out about. Um, uh, I don't, and it's, it, I want to be clear, like, it's not this existential thing to me, to me, it's like, we got to figure out how to live together, not just physically, but like trust each other and not hunker down and get defensive and try to like destroy the fabric of democracy. Because what climate change is, is essentially like ramping up risk and uncertainty. And like, we need to get not just our physical systems, but our relationships with each other, um, that trust of each other, especially across lines of race and the, like the wealth being so out of whack, particularly along lines of race. Like if we don't get that stuff better, like we're not going to be able to handle what climate is going to bring to it on top of it to like literally make our neighborhoods healthier. Like this is the whole, the East Phillips, like, if you're overburdened by air pollution and by pollution in your soil you're, and you don't have $500 in the bank for if the power goes out because of a storm, like you're just not going to hate, like people are not going to be able to handle climate change because there's just more risk in the system because of climate change. And so um, to me, like, I don't, I, I want us to make that connection between like the basic 
quality of life and economic security and social relationships in our city, those are essential like climate adaptation (laughs) strategies to me. They're like how we deal with increased risk and they're how we don't just have the most vulnerable in our community deal with even more because of the way climate is changing and because of the pressures from people coming here and because of the bigger storms that we're going to be experiencing, like all of these things, you know, I guess that's the way I see it intersecting. And it's like the real localized part of city work is like exciting climate work to me because it's like where we make sure that we can handle whatever it is that's coming our way and proactively prepare ourselves for the things that we know are going to be shifting and changing. So I don't know if this is ethical to do on a podcast, but I'd like to lobby. I'd like to lobby for Peggy Sue to be on the Minneapolis Planning Commission. <laughs> Sweet, that sounds great. <laughs> Peggy Sue, would you say yes if you were asked? Uh, you know what? To be honest with you, this is. Um, I uh, was going to apply and I forgot. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, here's what happened is that we bought our house. We closed on November 2nd and the I think the deadline was like October 31st. So I was just like busy. Okay, well, we'll I try it next time. So next time. So I was, next time I, was, was um, I thought of the I thought of the Wedge Live. I was home visiting my mom a couple weekends ago looking for some old pictures for the video for the 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 caucus video and I'm Kate Canoe. I'm a mom, a climate strategist, a scholar, a small business owner, and a former state representative. Uh, looking through like some old photo albums from my family. And I found the letter from 1976 or 78. I can't remember of when my dad was appointed to the new Brighton Planning Commission. <laughs> it was kind of, I was like, wow, there was this whole album of like Dan Knuth historic memorabilia. My dad passed away in October. So I'm like very nostalgic about stuff related to him right now. And so I, uh, I appreciated the like documentation of his service in the late seventies. You anticipated my next question yeah. again. I was going to ask if you had a parent on the planning commission. I saw that on your website. I did. Your yeah, I did. Actually, at both of my parents, I remember when I was older, my mom served on it, but my dad apparently did before I was born too. And maybe while I was alive, I don't remember it. Okay, let's, government structure. Do you support the strong mayor charter amendment? Why wouldn't you want to be a strong mayor? So I haven't, I will be on, I haven't taken a f- full strong position on this one. I would okay. say it makes me nervous to concentrate power um, in general, especially given the like last few years we've had in this country. Um, and I also question, uh, are we having this strong mayor debate because we've had a pretty weak mayor in the office, like just from a leadership perspective? Um, So I think I get why people want the accountability. Um, And I also feel like our government uh, departments have worked pretty well with the system we've had. And the one that is a strong mayor system is the police department. And that's the one we have the most challenges with. Um, And then I do really worry about with the strong mayor system and just looking at where votes in the city come from, you know, they come from Southwest. They, I live in ward seven. A lot of them come from ward seven. And um, I worry about particularly from a racial justice perspective, how people are represented at city hall when you concentrate power in the mayor's office in that way. Um, that said, I worked on city staff and like, it, it takes a, it takes quite a while to learn to like the relationships and how you navigate things. And it's a different kind of, um, the distributed power system is, uh, it takes a certain kind of disposition and person and willingness to like figure out how to navigate. And, um, that can be hard for someone who, you know, isn't in it day to day, you know, a resident of the city trying to make sense of things. Um, so I'm actively soliciting advice and perspectives on this one. I've talked to a couple of previous mayors about it. Um, I've, you know, obviously in conversation with um, folks in the city about it. Uh, and And the one thing I think is super important is to not think about, 
who's in the office and the structure of the office and to question, are we having this because are we having this conversation about a strong mayor system because of the challenges we've had with our mayor for the last few years? Um, So I'm curious what you all think about it as very, you know, interested, engaged residents of the city. So one of the concerns I have is that it kind of wipes out an advantage of the public safety charter amendment. Yeah. Like, would we, are you now flipping the reporting structure back to the mayor? I don't fully understand the answer to that question <laughs> yet. Yeah, that's that's not necessarily a question for you. That's a question for like the city attorney. But, yeah, exactly. Or, or a judge because, yeah. you know, we'll have a lawsuit. Uh, and I also appreciate that we have a strong council system in Minneapolis. Public hearings, you know, people talk about the personality conflicts, 13 people, but you've also got like 13 people who can take on different priorities. Mm-hmm. Whereas with a mayor, if a mayor doesn't care about climate or transportation and cares about some other priorities, you know, you can have those issues fall by the wayside and staff just does what they want or doesn't do anything. So I like a council led system in that way. Yeah. It feels more transparent to me. The only reason I understand how city government works and what I know about policy isn't because I, you know, I've read a book. I don't read books. I watch the city council. <laughs> so. Yeah. I I'm mean, I, that's sort of my, I've never studied political science. I, but I got elected and figured out how to try to pass laws and, you know, have worked as an advocate and an interested resident and citizen of the city um, and of my community. So yeah, I appreciate that. From a transparency perspective, the mayor's office feels like a black box. You know, Fry shows up on WCCO and says, hey, big new policy today. And we have no idea if it's being implemented, uh, how decisions were made about it. Yeah, I mean, it would be a significant because when you think, you know, when I think about my parallel of service in the um, the state level where you have like the, the legislative oversight part of um, state agencies and um that that trans that transparency part of it really matters, and we just I think that would be a significant sea change in the city to not have that. Um, it's just like a different set of muscles, and right now we have a council and staff that are like actively working on solutions and proposals and changes to how the city works. And I, yeah, I that transparency part of the conversation I think is a really helpful one. I say I am actively like scaffolding on like thinking through this and helping the people of the city think through the decision as well. Like, I don't feel like actually saying, yes, I support it. No, I don't support it is um, at this point, the best way to help us have the conversation we need to about it. Uh, Cause so that's why I think I'm bringing in some of the different perspectives and arguments about why or why not. I'm worried we won't have the conversation because it's going to have some weird name on the ballot, like government structure, and no one will know what it means. And it'll have this legalese description. So I'm worried we won't actually have the conversation. Peggy Sue? Oh, I was just going to say, like, I think the real problem is the Charter Commission itself. Yeah. Um, You know, I don't think that that is a representative body and it holds so much power. And the way you get appointed to the commission feels very sus to mm-hmm. me. And I don't think that there's, I don't know, that that would be something that I'd like to see change fundamentally is the fact that a Hennepin County judge is who appoints charter commission members seems really like sus to me. Yeah. The, for all sorts of reasons, we are... Um really concerned about our democracy and how it holds power structures in place or lets us change them or not just lets us, but like makes it our ability to work together as the the people of the city to change them. Um, And it, it's another one of these, why would people trust it? They don't understand it. They don't, there's not like a direct accountability. So I think what you're saying is totally something we need. And I think we are because we're seeing the power of the Charter Commission, right? So I think that will naturally bring a focus to it. um, And as it should, as it should bring a focus to it. 
Okay, Peggy Sue, I think we have to go to closing questions because we're at an hour and five minutes. <laughs> Do you have closing closing questions? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I think my closing question is just like, we got to get better fun facts. Okay. Your fun facts on your website are bad. Okay. Well, yeah. what, what kind of fun facts would be helpful? I, I've worn yeah. orange every day for 20 years. I wore it Not here. very interesting. Bad. Bad? The fact that my favorite insect is an ant, not in, actually animal is an ant. Um, I mean, that, that was disappointing. Disappointing. What else you got? I think, are you so busy, like, accomplishing things? You don't, like, enjoy the finer things of life, Kate? Like, what do you like? What's interesting? What's interesting to me? TV shows, books, podcasts, something weird. What, what's a TV show you like that you'd be embarrassed to tell us? You should tell us. Oh, I've watched more Grey's Anatomy than I care to admit. Not recently. That's very mainstream. It, it doesn't is. feel fun. My my favorite movie growing up uh, was the movie Toys with Robin Williams and John Cusack, just because okay. it was kind of weird. <laughs> and I liked that they created their own world. I usually turn it out about 20 minutes from the like battle scene for the last 20 minutes. I did not really like, um, but up until that part, I did really enjoy it. Um, I... Uh, I feel like I was kind of nerd. Like I was kind of nerdy when I was in college. I uh, worked at the Field Museum. I was in the insects division, and so I and I loved that. I went to University of Chicago, so I would either I would bike, and then my bike got stolen, so I would rollerblade up the lake shore, and I would go into like the parking ramp, like utility door of the museum, and I would go up. And the entrance to my lab was an unmarked door next to the South Pacific exhibit. And then I would go into the lab where they sequenced the DNA. This guy I worked for studied moths. And so we'd sequence moth DNA. But when he clearly didn't want to deal with his intern, I would get to go into the um, the uh, collections and just like look at the insects. And like, and I love natural history museums. Like I love the stuff of nature um, and the study of it. Like there are hugely problematic colonial things about natural history museums and like how white people from Europe, like went out and conquered. So we could get into that. But like, I just like this. I think like this is, per, I mean, I love the social lives of the ants, but I also just think like their bodies are beautiful and the way their legs are. And so I just love getting to work in a natural history museum when I was in college. And actually if, at least the last time I went to the field museum, there was a, a moth that I had helped collect on one of the public displays. And I was very excited about that. So that's, that might be a little, I could nerd out. That was interesting. It, that, that was, was very interesting. interesting. I would but... also say that when I live near Eloise Butler and it is the time of year, I love phenology, like how, how um, things happen over the course of the year. And this is, like the best season for phenology. Cause I really like the spring ephemerals, the flowers that come up on the forest floor before the trees leaf out. So they have like a really fast life cycle. And there's a, do you guys know what skunk cabbage is? Mm -hmm. So it's this like red, it almost looks like a red hook. Google skunk cabbage when we're done. It's a really cool looking plant and it is, it's one of the first and it actually creates its own heat and like melts the snow around it. So it can more quickly blossom and then it gets, uh, it smells like it smells bad because it attracts like ants and beetles by smelling bad to pollinate it. Um, so did you just see the picture? <laughs> yeah. And I think it's amazing. Like it literally creates its own heat as a plant and then lives its whole life before all the leaves come and make it so it can't get sun on the bottom of the forest floor. Kate Knuth, you've told us interesting facts and you've talked at length about interesting things, but you haven't told us any fun facts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, th I think you need to go back to your comms team and say, you know, we, we need fun facts. I, don't, I mean, we, I don't, I'm not going to like jump on a bar. Um, I, <laughs> Sorry, I did when, it, when I was like, when I was at the legislature. A good friend and I started a dance club. I do really like dance party music. I really like dancing. Um, so this is something I am looking forward to uh, post pandemic. I I like going to weddings because um, the dancing starts earlier than like at a dance club. It starts too late at a dance club. Like, I've, so what are you most what are you most looking forward to dance to? 
Think of the song you'll be dancing to. I love Timber by Kesha. Okay. And I also love Prince, but like the song that when I get, if it like just comes on the radio that I just want to dance to, it's Timber. It's going now. Peggy Sue, I don't know what that song is, so you'll have to judge if that's a fun fact. Is that a fun fact? Peggy Sue's audio failed, but she says yes, that is a fun fact. Timber, you better move, you better dance, Kate Knuth. <laughs> okay. okay. We had technical difficulties, but I learned that Kate has a millipede story, <laughs> which we've decided is the fun fact. Check Kate's website. Or the millipede story. You're, you're, you are forcing the uh, Hank and Milton the millipede to make an appearance on my website. Think of it as driving traffic for you, Kate. We're really we're giving you some yeah. free awesome. ad space here. <laughs> plug, plug, plug the website. Uh, Kate for MPLS.org. Okay. Well, we, this was a long one. Thank you for spending so much of your campaign with us. I know time is valuable. Yeah, well, thank you for the conversation. I like to dig in. And you all are folks that are willing to do that in our city. And I appreciate it. And thanks to my co-host, Peggy Sue, who did a really great job, as always. Oh, thanks, John. That's so nice of you. Okay. And, you know, I'm John Edwards. Peggy Sue wants me to say my name at the end. She's told me that in the past. And this has been the Wedge Life Podcast. And that's the end of the show. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.